So at this point, I'd like to introduce um, our partners. My name is Lisa Malloy. I'm with the Community College League, and we are very pleased to be partnering with SPUR. Um, I have Kevin Flanagan and Michael Rochman from SPUR who are on the line, and they'll be taking us through the updates for the energy storage as well as solar. So, Kevin? All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm trying to do the tricky thing here, which is to um, move the slides. All right, go ahead, Michael, you wanna kick it off? Sure, thank you, thank you, and uh, good morning for those who are attending. I'm Michael Rochman, the Managing Director of SPUR, which is a public agency, a joint powers authority formed more than 20 years ago for um, community colleges, county offices of education, and uh, public K-12 districts to aggregate purchasing power and expertise in the area of uh, utilities. So we've had long time had a natural gas program, electricity direct access program, we have procurement for various other items, LED lights and the like, and we have a master uh, contract for uh, solar PV and energy storage. Um, and there's a link there, uh, I think this is a live link, Kevin, so if someone were to get the, uh, the slide deck and follow that link, um, they would uh, go to the materials regarding our renewable energy aggregated procurement or REAP program, which covers uh, solar PV and energy storage. All right, yeah, that is correct. That's a live link. Thank you, Michael. I'm gonna forward to the next slide here. So I'm really, oops, really excited to uh, be talking about this topic today. Um, this is more or less the agenda for the webinar. Um, we, uh, SPUR has over 240 member districts in our JPA and increasingly, we're getting a lot of questions about energy storage uh, for lots of reasons. Uh, pricing on batteries is, is coming down dramatically. Uh, more and more vendors are participating in the energy storage marketplace, so which means more salespeople are calling colleges and schools. Uh, utility demand charges are going up dramatically. Uh, battery storage is also you know, the new shiny thing. So we thought we would have a webinar to provide an introduction to the basics, uh, clear up some misconceptions and hopefully spark some questions. Uh, if you have questions today, we will have some time at the end of the webinar to answer those, or of course, we'd be more than happy to answer questions offline, um, and we will provide our contact information at the end of the webinar. Um, so first, we will talk about the main value driver for energy storage, which is peak demand reduction. Uh, we will talk about what, what is peak demand, how it's reduced, and, and what it means for your bottom line. Uh, we also talk about another application for energy storage, which is microgrids and emergency power supply. Um, we're also going to talk about how setting your goals for uh, an energy storage project is really important. Um, and so how defining your project goals will, will kind of define your energy storage project strategy. Um, lastly, we'll talk about some key things to consider and be aware of when thinking about a potential energy storage project so that you can be better prepared. So, as I mentioned earlier, the primary driver of value for energy storage projects is reducing peak demand charges on your utility bill. So, so what does this mean? First, I guess it's probably good to start with a definition, uh, a demand charge. So, every month, the utility will divide the entire month into 15-minute intervals and identify the 15-minute interval in the month when you use the most energy. So, that's, that's your 15-minute spike, your peak demand spike and that drives your demand charge. So sometimes when I explain this to people, their response is, well, that seems really unfair. Um, and it, it does seem kind of unfair until you think about why a demand charge exists. For the utility, the demand charge plays an important role in its primary directive, uh, its primary mandate, which is uh, electricity reliability. So when we go to hit the light switch or turn on your computer, we expect that you know, electricity will, will be there. Um, and quite frankly, you can say what you want about the utilities, but they are really, really, really good at reliability. Um, so the demand charge is there to ensure that the utility has the necessary generating resources dispatched to meet your load, all of your load, uh, including uh, these demand spikes. So, um, so I guess, you know, why, why does a community college care about demand charges? I mean, you know, there's really kind of two reasons. Um, one, uh, demand charges are going up dramatically. 
Um, and for any given utility customer, they might represent 40 to 60% of your monthly utility bill, uh, which is a lot. Uh, the other reason why we are talking about them today is demand charges are really tough to manage. You know, as it, as it turns out, there are a lot of 15 minute intervals in a given month and managing those spikes can be like playing the old game of whack-a-mole. Uh, you hit the ball over here just to find that it's kind of pops its head up over there. Um, and so the promise of energy storage is that it's a, it's a technology that can be really effective in helping reduce demand charges uh, because it can discharge quickly and essentially eliminate those demand spikes, thus reducing your demand charges. Uh, so in this example that we're looking at here, um, uh, this would be an example of how energy storage can be used to reduce your demand profile. Uh, and in this particular example, let's say if you're in Southern California Edison territory or pg e territory, um, this would represent, you know, roughly $8,000 savings in that month. Um, so it's not a trivial amount of money that, that we're talking about. Um, what size battery, you know, is best for you will really depend on how, how spiky, quote unquote, spiky your load is and what your 15 minute load profile looks like. Uh, from month to month. Um, it's a really data intensive analysis, but really important to figuring out system sizing um, and also for getting a feeling for how much you, you might be able to save. Um, really, you know, the spikier your load, uh, the more the energy storage can do for you to reduce your demand. So if you have a really flat load, uh, which is what the utilities love, then energy storage may not be a great fit. So again, the energy storage opportunity for you and your site will really depend on doing a site specific analysis of your 15 minute load data. So your specific demand charges uh, will be different based on your utility, um, the utility rate, you know, for, for your specific meter, uh, but can always be found in the utility tariff. So this is just one example. This is a screenshot from pg e E20 tariff, uh, which is a really common rate for large colleges to be on. Uh, you can see in the summer months, uh, that the total demand charge for an E20 customer uh, served at primary voltage is upwards of $40 per kW. So again, it's, it's not a small amount, and um, this is pretty typical. You'll see similar figures in, in Edison Territory and down in San Diego. Um, you can also look at your utility bill, and you'll see a line item on your bill for demand charges. Uh, and like I mentioned earlier, you'll, you'll notice that your demand charges can easily be 40 to 60% of your utility bill in a given month. So I think this graph is, is really interesting. Uh, it shows the rate of increase uh, for demand charges over the last 10 years or so. Uh, again, this is for PG&E's E20 primary rate. And of course, it'll be different from rate to rate and utility to utility, but this is a common rate for large community colleges. Uh, over the last 10 years, demand charges have been escalating uh, on this rate at an average rate of 8.75% uh, per year. Um, which is the fastest growing portion of your utility bill by far. So compare this to how fast utility energy charges have been going up, which are your monthly volumetric charges, uh, or the total number of kilowatt hours you use in a, in a month, um, which has been more like 2.7% uh, per year. So again, you can see why people are excited about the promise of energy storage to reduce demand charges. Um, it's, it's a big cost, it's, it's going up quickly, and it's really, quite frankly, uh, really tough to manage. Uh, you might be thinking, uh, well, I'm lucky I'm on direct access. I don't, I don't pay demand charges. Um, and you're right that you are lucky to be on direct access, but unfortunately, um, you still pay a demand charge to the utility, albeit, albeit less. Um, so the demand charge is, of course, lower uh, if you're a direct access customer from a, from a total, total dollars perspective. Uh, but again, looking at the PG&E E20 rate, you can actually see that demand charges for direct access customers have actually gone up even more quickly than they have for bundled customers over the last 10 years or so. And also keep in mind that as a direct access customer, you also pay a form of a demand charge to your supplier, uh, your ESP, uh, which is called the resource adequacy charge. So, so energy storage uh, can help with that. So this next slide is really important, uh, you know, really whether or not you're looking at energy storage, because it, it will have an impact on your utility costs, even if you change nothing. And, and this issue should be on your radar in case you are making really any sort of energy related investment, um, you know, whether it's lighting or solar or new pumps for a pool, um, whatever. Um, this, this particular issue is, is really critical to understand because you want to make sure you're evaluating uh, an energy-related investment through the appropriate lens. So, 
So a little bit of background. Historically, you know, for a long time, the most expensive kilowatt hour that you could buy from the utility uh, was from noon to 6 p.m. during the summer. Um, this is what's called the peak period. However, in the last five to 10 years, you know, the supply demand fundamentals in California's energy marketplace have, have changed dramatically, uh, primarily driven by the proliferation of solar and the availability of, of cheap energy during the middle of the day. Uh, so the utilities, in response to this change uh, in the marketplace, have been lobbying the Public Utilities Commission to allow them to change their definitions of time of use. Uh, so for the utilities, the most expensive kilowatt hour to procure on your behalf, the customer, is, is no longer in the middle of the day. Um, so what they're doing is, is changing the definition of the peak period. Uh, and they were granted um, in a decision last year by the Public Utilities Commission uh, to move um, that peak period from noon to six uh, to later in the day um, from four to nine. And so this new normal, what we kind of affectionately refer to as time of use 2.0, uh, you'll see a peak period during the afternoon and not in the middle of the day. Um, so this is obviously not good for solar economics because solar power plants produce most of their energy between noon and six when the sun is shining. Uh, but energy storage can be used to improve solar project economics. Um, also, just kind of as a side note in their proceeding, uh, the Public Utilities Commission indicated that they would like to see rate differentials flatten out over time, so less of a difference between peak and off-peak. Um, and they also want to kind of readdress the definition of time of use every five years or so to make sure that it accurately reflects, you know, the wholesale marketplace um, supply demand fundamentals. So the bottom line, really, the takeaway here is that energy pricing uh, and the way it's priced by the utilities is changing. Uh, it's going to continue to change. And it's good to be aware of this if you are considering an energy-related investment. Um, energy storage can be really useful because it is a relatively flexible resource and can help you keep up with the changes uh, and help you adapt to the changes so that you, so that you aren't caught off guard. So the next part of the webinar is really meant to just make you aware of some things in case you are considering energy storage. Um, number one, you know, brains matter. Um, really, when you, when you think about it, the you know, battery technology itself is is pretty dumb. Uh, if you looked inside of these um, these, these stacks of, of energy storage batteries, you, you're essentially going to see a, a string of double A batteries strung together in a circuit. Uh, the real magic to making energy storage work is is the controls, the brains that tell the battery when to charge and discharge and for how long to charge and discharge. You remember, you know, back to our discussion about demand, um, there are a lot of 15 minute intervals in a given month. And so the battery has to essentially predict when those demand spikes are going to happen and discharge just enough energy to reduce that demand spike. This means that in, in, it's, you know, taking in real time load data from your facility. It's comparing that load data to historical load data and making a split second decision to charge or discharge and for how long. So it's really, when you think about it, really pretty impressive. Uh, but the bottom line here is that the technology that controls uh, the algorithm that informs the operations behind the battery really, really matters and really important. Uh, a good example of this, of course, is if you have solar and, and let's imagine a random cloud passing over the solar array, uh, you know, your solar production as a result will go down. Uh, your load being served at the you know by the utility will go up, and that causes a demand spike. Um, you know, ideally, hopefully, uh, the battery uh, should recognize that spike is occurring. Uh, it'll discharge energy and it'll prevent the utility from seeing a spike uh, on your load profile. Um, so another question we often get is: Should we own or lease? You know, our perspective on this at Spur is that the lease or, or the service agreement model approach makes the most sense. Uh, first, there are often uh, tax credits that can be leveraged by the developer to your advantage that you wouldn't be able to necessarily take advantage of yourself if you own the system. Uh, but really more importantly, when you lease or enter into an energy storage services agreement, you're essentially offloading the performance risk, um, assuming the contract is well written uh, onto the provider. Uh, so, you know, you, you might be giving up a bit of the upside savings uh, in this scenario, but the vendor is really forced to put their money in where their mouth is, which is what we like. Um, you know, let's be all be honest here. You know, these are fairly new applications. They're not exactly bleeding edge, but 
you know, the market is still changing and technologies are still being perfected. Uh, so we see ownership as, as potentially um, risky. Uh, shared savings. So some vendors uh, offer a shared savings approach. Uh, we aren't huge fans of this approach because we really see it as giving up uh, too much of the upside. Um, it's also tough for the vendor to finance this arrangement because the revenue streams are really somewhat unpredictable. So in short, we're seeing a movement away uh, from the shared savings approach. Um, degradation. So batteries do degrade over time, depending on the chemistry of the battery and how how the battery is operated. Um, the key thing here is to make sure that the contract speaks to who is responsible for the battery replacement if and when uh, the battery has degraded. Um, measurement and verification. Uh, you know, again, from a contractual perspective, you want to make sure that the vendor is not only committed to showing you how much you are saving, um, which seems like an obvious thing, but you also want to make sure that the contract gives you access to all of the source data so that you can perform those calculations on your own uh, if you want to. Um, uh, performance guarantee, um, this is another contract item that we think is really important and, and should be you know, a key component that you evaluate um, when looking at an energy storage project. Uh, performance contracts, typically what we're seeing in the marketplace is, is you know, uh, a 10 year term. Um, the vendor that won our uh, piggybackable RFP has a 10 year term in their contract, for example. Uh, space consideration. So, you know, we are talking about uh, a 10 year agreement. So it is important to think about where the system will be sited. You can see uh, two photographs here of, of some sample uh, energy storage projects. The, the, the project on the right hand side. You know, it's roughly two parking spaces. I think that is a uh, roughly a one megawatt hour um, battery. Um, so, in, you know, in thinking about space considerations, it, it's not as big a deal as, say, you know, space considerations for a solar project. Uh, but it is a long term contract and you want to have a high degree of confidence that you can site the system somewhere for the long term. And more importantly, that you will have a load at that facility uh, for the energy storage to offset. Um, one of the exciting, you know, real promises of energy storage is the ability to provide what are called grid services uh, to the utility itself. So this means that a battery could be located at your site uh, behind your meter and used by the utility to regulate the grid, for example, to assist with congestion or voltage fluctuations. Um, we actually have one example of this uh, at the pilot program in Southern California Edison Territory uh, in the West L.A. Basin where Southern California Edison is actually paying uh, customers to locate energy storage uh, behind the meter to provide grid services. Um, so, you know, kind of looking forward here, there, there's no question that the state is really doubling down on energy storage. Um, the state sees it as a critical piece of, of getting into getting our grid modernized. So we are excited about, you know, more and more of these grid services opportunities emerging in the coming years because it means uh, more value for energy storage projects. Um, you know, something to consider from a contractual perspective as it relates to this issue um, is that you, you know, if, you know, and, and this is kind of lined out in our contract with the vendor that won our RFP, is that the vendor shouldn't be able to use the energy storage to device to generate additional revenues down the road without your consent. And, and the reason we have this written into the contract is it gives you, the customer, uh, where the system is cited, it gives you the opportunity down the road to negotiate a piece of that action, a piece of that revenue down the road when these opportunities do become available. Um, and, you know, given the energy storage contracts are typically uh, 10 years, uh, we think this is a, a smart thing to do. All right, next slide. So when we first started talking, um, you know, we talked about demand charges and, and how that's, you know, really important to reducing uh, your total utility costs, but you might have a different goal. So, you know, we've talked about how energy stores can be used to reduce demand charges and save you money. But another, you know, increasingly popular application is, is that people are really excited about is using energy storage for microgrid applications. Um, and so it's important here to kind of point out that this type of project, the microgrid project, is not necessarily about saving you money on your utility bill. In fact, it might cost you a lot of money to design and implement a microgrid system. Uh, but the value here is really about mitigating operational risk and not really saving money on your utility bill. 
Um, so what is a microgrid? Um, the definition, depending on who you talk to, is different. Um, but really, you know, they're essentially mini grids. Um, they can be either grid tied or islanded, so kind of distinct and separate from the utility. Uh, they usually rely on a number of generating resources that are behind the meter uh, to provide energy to your facility or campus. So um, on-site generation resources usually includes a combination of solar or fuel cell, uh, combined heat and power systems like a cogen, and then typically, increasingly, it's paired with energy storage to provide that kind of operational flexibility. Um, benefits of, of having a uh, microgrid can include improved reliability, improved power quality, especially if you are at the end of utility distribution line where the power quality is poor um, uh, or spotty, uh, the ability to operate during a grid shutdown, which is especially important for, for mission critical facilities such as IT or emergency operation centers. And finally, you know, just the value of having more control and more independence over your energy supply is seen as increasingly valuable um, to our members and to, to other uh, schools and colleges that we talk to. Um, so again, implementing a microgrid is not necessarily about saving dollars on your utility bill. Uh, it's about mitigating operational risk. Uh, it can often be expensive and difficult to implement, uh, but in, in the right situations, and, and, and again, depending on your goals, uh, it can make a lot of sense. Uh, the good news uh, here, uh, as it relates to uh, incentives, is that all three major utilities in California have incentive money available uh, for energy storage projects. Uh, the program is called the Self-Generation Incentive Program. Uh, it's funded by ratepayer dollars. Um, you actually pay into this fund each month, and, and you can see this, this line item on your utility bill called the Public Purpose Program Funds. Um, the bottom line here is there's a lot of money available for energy storage projects, and, and actually, uh, there's a bill making its way through the legislature right now that will see if it's passed a lot more money uh, pumped into this program uh, for energy storage projects um, and and so you know we'll see what happens there um, one thing that the sgip program did uh, implement in recent years was to require a five percent application fee uh, essentially a deposit on the project uh, that is only refunded if the project is completed um, they implemented this because uh, one vendor in particular was was more or less abusing the SGIP application process and was really, you know, submitting way too many applications for projects that, that weren't really viable. So if you're going to go down this path and apply for the incentive funding, you know, I think the bottom line here is you want to have a good idea that the project is going to make sense uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, you're, you're putting out um, funds uh, for the project that you may not get back. Um, you know, like any good incentive, they're designed to decline over time. So the sooner you apply, the more money you get. Um, currently, PG&E and SDG&E are in step two out of, out of five steps, and SEE is in step three out of five steps. Um, uh, if you'd like more information, you can certainly ask us. There's also a couple of links here uh, that you, you'll be able to click on that will take you uh, to the SGIP administrative page for each utility to get more information about the amount of funding that's available, how the application process works, uh, et cetera. So uh, that concludes our webinar for today. Uh, we have about five minutes left if there are any questions um, from the participants. So I have opened up a group chat page. Um, hopefully everybody can see it. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to type them in and um, Kevin can address the whole group. Well, it's not looking like we're having any, having any questions, which is a good sign. Uh, Kevin did a good job, but um, we certainly are going to be available to answer any questions. Either you can send them to um, me at the league, or you can reach out to uh, Kevin directly, and he'd be very happy to assist you. I will go ahead and post this onto our website as well so you can take a look at the slides again but um, thank you everybody for being a part of this and we look forward to our next webinar with more information 
um, about upcoming projects. Thank you.